I'd like to welcome now Tracy Johnson uh, to give a presentation on the new roles for consumers in primary care, Canada and United Kingdom. Tracy is the CEO of Inala Primary Care and also Churchill Fellowship. Um, I won't go into her bio because we are a little bit behind time. So, Tracy. Hello, and thank you for welcoming hear me, today, hear me here today. And it's kind of nice that um, here I am following the first country that I actually visited on my Churchill Fellowship. Um, our previous presenter has spoken about the hospital perspective, and I guess I'm here to talk to you about the primary care perspective, because it's that full continuum of what we provide in care from cradle to grave that really makes such a fundamental difference to how we feel about the care we receive and the experience and outcomes of that care. So. Let's get started. We live, work, experience, consume, pay for an incredibly busy healthcare environment. So there's some key statistics up there for you. So on an average day in Australia, 342,000 people receiving care. Lots of people travelling by ambulance, even by air ambulance, which is a kind of unique thing here in Australia that we take great pride on. An awful lot of people giving birth, so our population keeps growing, and to pay for all of that, one in four of our tax dollars going to this very expensive beast called our healthcare system. It's actually the largest employer, and it's one of the things that's probably our most troubling policy environment at the moment. Despite all of that, and despite all of us sitting around over barbecues and at other times going, oh my goodness, you know, tearing our hair out about, about the healthcare system, we're actually the fourth ranked healthcare system in the world. So there's room to go, there's room to improve, but nonetheless we need to give ourselves credit sometimes that together carers, patients and the community actually are doing some very good work. The GP perspective. So of those 342,000 episodes of care occurring a day in healthcare, an awful lot of them actually happen in the GP space. But GP care, and that's the area that I come from, primary care, your local doctor's surgery, is actually under enormous pressure. We often hear about the pressure that the healthcare system's under because we hear about ramped ambulances, we hear about patients waiting months and years to get the surgery they think they need. What we don't hear as much about is what's going on in primary care and it's also a system under pressure, which is why the patient experience that you might have once had with that doctor that you'd had, that was your mother's doctor, that was your doctor, that then became your children's doctor, has perhaps changed. So in the primary care space, of those one in four dollars raised to fund healthcare, your GP surgery takes up just 6% of the healthcare budget. And yet of those 342,000 episodes of care, it provides the vast bulk of them. So there's huge opportunity for us to work with our patients and do a really great job. And of course, we're doing this fairly efficiently and for a fairly low price. So that figure of 83.6% of bulk patients seeing a GP being bulk billed has recently just gone up to 85, close to 85%. So we're doing it for, on average, about 38 bucks an episode of care. It's a pretty impressive result. What's really interesting about that, though, is that in the process, we're actually stressing people. So the key people that you rely on to provide your care are increasingly saying, I'm not sure I want to continue in this field of work. So about 21% of GPs are actively considering whether they actually want to leave the profession or retire early. So clearly, we've got to do something new and different. So what I did was I traveled. I was fortunate enough to apply for a Churchill Fellowship I took 15 flights, visited 43 sites over a period of three months and had a look at what they were doing. And one of the big things that I saw was the difference in care that can be delivered when we truly think about the patient and put them at the centre. So I'm going to short share just a snapshot of some of the things that I saw in that nearly three months from those different countries there. The big thing that I saw was that primary care was being put at the heart the centre, it was given the primary place of precedence in healthcare around the world. That meant that funding was changing, it meant that the roles and responsibilities rolling out for primary care were changing. And there was a whole lot of recognition that GPs could actually do an awful lot more and that patients would like that, patients were demanding that. Wouldn't it be nice, rather than having to go and see a dermatologist in a hospital setting and pay 26 bucks for the car park, wait for two hours to see them, if you could go to your GP and actually get 
that nasty rash that you've been living with for the last five years, that eczema, dealt with by your local GP. Wouldn't it be nice if as a diabetic, instead of having to go and see your endocrinologist, you could actually get equivalent care at your local GP surgery. So in the NHS, they've created these things called vanguards, and that's exactly what happens. That's because the NHS is investing in certain GP sites who put their hands up and say, yes, I want some extra skilling, I want some extra resources, I want to be part of this community because I know that in my community, mental health might be a big issue or chronic disease of certain type might be a big issue and they're putting their hands up and saying, okay, we'll deliver the services, but rather than delivering them in the same way that they're done in the hospitals, they're actually working with patients to come up with new models of care. And it's meaning that patients are actually turning up. In an awful lot of instances, the outpatient services in hospitals, around about 25 or more percent of patients don't turn up for their appointments. When you start delivering that care in GP land, you actually get a much higher show rate at much lower cost with much better outcomes. So this right care, right time, right place, but how do we do that? How do we incentivise it? We need to change the funding model, and that's what I saw overseas. It was about changing the funding model for the sort of care that patients valued the most, and it was also about the outcomes that patients valued the most. So there were a whole variety of measures that were being instituted in these systems to drive change to the way that care was delivered. And one of those things was, in fact, patient experience in very, very many of these countries. There was ongoing measuring and monitoring and many ways of engaging with patients to really find out what was that patient experience, how satisfied were they, how involved and engaged were they in their own care? I've got mentioning there moving from volume to value. At the moment, GP care in a Medicare environment has increasingly been dri driven to six-minute medicine. That's what pays the leasing costs. That what is what pays the staff to keep the lights on. In other environments, they're going, well, maybe seeing a patient in six minutes is not actually, A, giving them enough time to express themselves, B, form the right relationship, C, they mightn't even be seeing the same person time after time, so they're feeling uncomfortable. How do we change from that volume to pay the bills and just get through the waiting list mentality back to a value mentality where we truly partner with patients cradle to grave? And that's where the models that I'll start talking about in a minute become important. So it's not about seeing patients, it's about how do we support patients, was the language that I was increasingly hearing. This was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation. We need to move from caring for patients to caring with patients and their families and their care team. If you do things to people, they feel like an object. They don't feel part of the process. They're less likely to own and engage in the journey. Every system that I visited, they were using this language, whereas at the moment we still too frequently talk about, I'm giving care to somebody. This group here, St Elizabeth's, it's a Canadian healthcare system. It came out of a Catholic community. Um, they run hospitals, they run community care facilities, they run aged care homes. They have embraced patient-centred care in ways that I thought were quite extraordinary, which is why I put their logo up there. So the basic principles they live by are those four there. And when I say they do patient-centred care, I really mean it. So every time you go and see somebody or you interact with somebody in their healthcare system, to give you an example, some of the home, home care work that GPs coordinate. So when the nurses are coming out to see you in your home, the first thing they ask you is, if I have a few extra minutes at the end of the period that I'm with you, what would you most likely to do today? And it might not be something related to your healthcare, but in delivering that extra little service, changing the water in your flower vase, you know, helping them undo some jam lids, things like that. It actually really boosts the feeling of engagement with that patient and it delivers something of value to them and yet it can take almost no time. So they're constantly finding little ways of making that patient experience collaborative, engaged and really about what the patient values. To deliver this sort of care, value-based care as opposed to volume-based care, Within the same budget envelope, in most of these systems, they've got the same budget constraints that we have, or even more. Because surprise, surprise, the youngest Western country in the world is New Zealand. We're actually the second youngest. And a lot of the countries that I visited are way down the ageing curve in comparison to us. So their budgetary constraints are actually much worse than ours. So what they've said is, OK, do you need to see a doctor? Do you need to see a doctor? There's an awful lot of allied health people, nurses and other people that actually can provide really great care at much lower costs. And most importantly, there's heaps of them out there. 
whereas doctors are few and far between. So they've started asking questions about who should be delivering the care. And you've got a list of people up there. How would you like to go to your GP practice and have a health coach? I'd probably be in for that. In an awful lot of these systems, that's what they're doing. They're employing community health workers and health coaches to actually partner with your clinical team and yourself and your family to provide much better care. They're using people like pharmacists. Who's been in this room on a medication, same medication for more than 10 years? A good smattering of you. So you kind of know the routine, don't you? But every time you need to get a new prescription, who do you have to go and see? You have to go and see a GP or your specialist in our model. In some of these models, they're saying, well, actually, if you're staying within target, nothing else has changed and it's just a repeat script, maybe you don't have to see your GP. Maybe you could actually have all of your work up done by a non-dispensing pharmacist who actually lives and works in the GP practice. And if they check everything out and it's all OK, then the GP might just quickly issue a script, much shorter episode of work for the GP. Or in some countries, they've actually moved to those non-dispensing pharmacists and indeed nurses being able to issue those repeat prescriptions so long as everything remains within range. They're also acknowledging that in complex chronic disease care, and that's where a lot of our health system costs are being driven, it's actually not about the medical stuff so much as it's about the patient journey outside of the healthcare system. So they need social work, they need volunteers to support them, they need a whole lot of stuff from the social welfare sector and how we join all of that up and together is actually what makes the difference because the patients are often on the right drug. It's all of the other things that they need to change and modify their lives and maintain their health that becomes important. So everywhere I went, I saw this notion of much bigger teams, much more coordinated care, much more comprehensive options for the patient. So patient-centered care, what do we even mean by that? I'd actually prefer to see it as person-centred care. Because you know what, if you start labelling someone as a patient, we use the language of the patient a lot here in Australia, that kind of says that you're an unwell victim. An awful lot of the care that we provide is actually to people. People who might have something that's diagnostic, but they're still people. So my challenge to you is how can we move not from patient-centred care, that's a big journey, but how could we go a bit further and talk about person-centred care? How could we put the patient or in my case, the person, at the centre of that care, as well as their family and their carers. You know what, if you're living with a complex disability or some sort of complex condition, it might be that your partner and other family members are working. If you're an older person, your children are working. So how you fit your care routines in with the lives of all of these other people becomes really important. How do we engage with them to make sure that the way we schedule care actually allows all of those other members of the patient's care team to do their job and do it well, as well as have the rest of their life working. In some other systems, that's actually a performance measure. Have you engaged with the patient's or the person's family and their care team and tried to negotiate appropriate intervals of care and timing of care so that everyone can get on with doing their job, rather than the classic that we get now, which is, oh, I'll be at your home sometime in the next three hours? How do you plan around that? We also know that patients want to have as much care delivered locally as they can. So this person-centred care model says, put me at the centre, bring it to me. It says, make it personal to me. I'm not the same as that person there and that person over there. And it says, keep me well. Don't just treat me as sickness, keep me well. And coordinate everything. Why should I have to go to the hospital three days in a week? Can't I get it all done on the one day? In other systems, there's performance measures and bonus payments around those sorts of issues. Which leads me on to this, the healthcare home. So how do we bring person-centred care right back into our communities? In other parts of the world, they've embraced this, the healthcare home, or the patient-centred medical home. It goes by a number of names. I just want to quickly talk you through what it means, because that little document up here uh, was produced by Dr Steve Hamilton and his team of other specialist advisors for the government. It was released in March. It actually says that from 1 July 2017, Australia will be having a pilot of 200 of these to see how they go around the nation. If you're lucky enough, hopefully you'll be in a catchment where you'll have a healthcare home that you can go to. What does it mean? It means this. If we start on the bottom, continuous care. At the moment, do you often find when you go to your GP, you might see this GP one time, and then you see another GP another time, and another GP, 
another time. So that continuity of relationship, the continuity of the conversation, the intimacy of knowledge about you can be fragmented by having too many people caring for you. So in these sorts of models, they try and anchor you to one care environment and one group of people. They also say, let's do as much as we can in the same place. So let's bring the physio in, let's bring the mental health in, let's bring a whole range of other things into the one place and actually have them working as a team. And let's not have the, oh, I'll send you off and give you a referral to here, and then those two care providers never talk to each other. It's actually about providing time, systems and arrangements so that that comprehensive care can happen and also be coordinated. Patients at the centre, what do you want? What decisions do you want to make? What education and engagement do you need to make the right decisions for you at this point in time? So there's actually time, tools and systems and people to help you make those decisions rather than the doctor that you're eyeballing who's looking very agitated because they've already spent six minutes with you going, I'll just write this referral for you before you even get a chance to think about it. It's accessible. So these centres are opening a lot longer. They're open from maybe 6.30 in the morning till 10.30 at night because, let's face it, you don't get sick, you don't get confused, you don't get questions, just 9 to 5. And yet a lot of GP practices are only open those sorts of, you know, maybe 8 till 5, 5.30. So they're providing longer hours so that when you get sick you can go and see the care team that knows you. They're accountable. So at the moment, if you go and see your doctor, they bill Medicare every time you go and see them. In these environments, they've got bundled payments, and it's really up to that care team to go, how could we do this differently? And by patient, because different patients have different needs, for a fixed sum of money. And at that point, they start becoming much more creative. Because if they're being paid 1,200 bucks a quarter to manage you, you don't have to just see a GP. You can see a whole variety of other people, and it's in everyone's best interest to make sure that your care is delivered for that amount. Under our current system, there's actually gaming incentives for the doctor to bring you back and again and again and again, because every time you come, they can bill Medicare. And this notion of care coordination. So somebody's speaking to your optometrist to make sure that your eye checks are happening if you've got diabetes. Somebody's speaking to the podiatrist to make sure that your foot checks are happening if you've got diabetes. The whole team works together. Very different to what happens in our GP practices now. It also means that these GP practices start looking at a healthcare neighbourhood. So how do I interact with the social welfare sector, the hospital system, and all of these other care providers to provide the outcomes that the patient wants? To do that, and this is the nitty gritty stuff, we need different governance models. We need models where patients are engaged. So in Canada, they've got new accreditation standards. So in those accreditation standards, they went through, it took them two years to take out all of the language which was about doing care to patients and made it much more about with, for, together. Two years it took them to take all of that paradigm and framework out because it was so endemic. They've instituted that on every GP practice that's a healthcare home, they must have a patient advisory committee. These are run as private businesses in other parts of the world, just as they are in Australia, but they actually have an advisory committee. So forget hospitals needing advisory committees, they need them too. Your GP practice actually has involvement from patients. They sit and they start planning. How much more care do we need around mums and bubs? How much more care do we need around respiratory disease, etc.? Because they're seeing the overall population data in that catchment and by that practice, and they're participating and saying, well, let's focus on this area or this area. They go in and they accredit practices. So it's not just an independent clinical team that come in and accredit the GP practice. Patients are part of that accreditation team as well. They work on adverse events, trying to identify what went wrong. Um, and they even sit at the board meetings of those advisory committees and look at what patients are saying in that practice. So we've had some notions of co-design talked about by the previous speaker, so I won't tarry there. Passionate believer in it. I'm also a big believer in co-delivery. There's a lot of capability, a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of resource, a lot of commitment out there in the community. So not only how can we work together to design the thing, but how can we get it delivered together? So in the UK, they've moved to integrating health and social care budgets for any patient with long-term conditions. So the notions of co-design and co-delivery become even more complex because there's an awful lot more going into that envelope for care for that patient. 
That logo there actually is from the Canadian Heart Institute based in Ottawa. They have the best outcomes for cardiac health in all of the North American continent. So what used to happen when you were discharged from hospital there was there would be nurses ringing you every few days, a whole range of interactions going on that were quite expensive. They've moved to a model now where, based on big workshops that they ran, lots of input, lots of research, lots of data, lots of deliberation, where when you discharge from hospital, in fact, before you discharge from hospital, they talk to your GP, so your GP knows what to expect. But beyond that, you get these automated calls. And I know it's election time, so as soon as I say automated calls, you'll start thinking that some politician's about to ring you. It's not like that at all. It's actually, the phone will ring and there'll be a voice recording and it will say, you know, have you weighed yourself today? If you've come in in this range or this range, do this. If you've, you know, had this happen and you're concerned about that, do you want to hear about that? And you can use the telephone to click on numbers and it will start playing you education devices and resources and things. If you don't want to do it now and you want them to ring back in two hours, again, you can use your telephone keypad to dictate all of those things. If you really want to speak to a person, you can be put through to a person. So it's actually making you in charge of the time frame, the content, the quality, and guess what? It's reduced hospital readmissions by 30%, made patient outcomes over the next five years improve by 25% because they're doing it together in the place, time that the patients want. And they've been able to fund even more innovation because rather than bringing patients from regional Canada back to Ottawa to see their cardiologist, they're doing it with the GP. And all of that extra tra travel money that used to have to be involved is going into new models of care. So, sharing care. We all need to get involved in our healthcare. We need to make decisions. So, in Canada particularly, they're leading the world around shared decision-making tools. Really amazing educational devices that can be put together so that when the GP says to you, you've got this condition, your option is this drug or this drug or this treatment, you don't make the decision on the spot. Often they employ nurses to come and then work with you, give you the education and information you and your family need and make the decision you want to make at a particular point in time. Likewise, there's more and more resourcing going into how do we help patients manage. They might see their clinical team 1% of the year if they're lucky. The other 99% of the time they're doing it themselves. So how do we enable them to do that? This thing was actually run as a public health campaign in Canada, televised emails, to, uh, not emails, mail outs to every home, etc., so that when you go and see any member of your care team, you actually feel enabled and empowered because the television ads told you, always ask these sorts of questions, don't sit back passively. And it's changed the way people think and interact with care. Lots more data in all of these systems. I run a GP practice with 44 staff working out of it, and I can tell you, Data is my biggest frustration. The sort of systems we have here are abominable. They do not help us deliver great care. In all of these other systems, they've invested in IT so that monthly, you're getting a dashboard to your practice of which patients are actually having falling health, which patients are not getting their medications dispensed. So therefore, if they're not taking their meds, what's happening to them? They're getting all of this data, and they're getting data that's comparable between my GP practice and the GP practice down the road and the one a bit further on, so that together we can all improve our care. Because we don't want to hurt anyone in healthcare, but often we don't know what we're doing badly. So until we get this sort of data, we can't do anything differently. And this sort of experience is incentivised with real dollars in other systems. If you can improve the outcomes that patients get, you actually change your funding criteria. So, someone once said to me, we all know that patient care has changed when patients get to say, doctor, I'm waiting for you. Wouldn't that be nice? I've been there. So, these pictures were actually taken from a Virginia Mason healthcare facility in Kirkland in Seattle just down the road from Microsoft's main headquarters. So when I arrived in this facility, and let me scare you, it was a facility built to service 60,000 patients, a GP practice to service 60,000 patients. I was given one of these, and I was told to go to a room in the beach wing. So it was a big square building, and it was quadrangles in different colours, and I went to the beach room. That's an RFID tag, been used for decades to monitor inventory and track where things are in warehouses. So I was given this to tell me I needed to go to beach 
to remind me what it would look like in beach. They have pictures all around that have got water in them. And I took my RFID tag, I found my room, and I put it on the wall. Within seconds, somebody walked into the room. They knew I was there, and they were ready to deliver care to me. And that's the experience every day in this practice. How do they do it? Because they actually know who's coming in, what's wrong with them, what they're anticipating to have to do to them. And that's why their waiting room, they don't have a waiting room. You walk in, you get your RFID tag, you check yourself into your treatment room, and voila, the right people come to your room because they monitor actively who their patients are and what they need. And it's more likely that the GP surgery calls you in than you volunteer to go to the GP surgery. So it's much more organised. There's not the chaos of sitting there waiting for hours and hours for care. This is actually a picture from the Midlands in New Zealand. So how have they managed to get to this model? They've done it a similar way. They've actually used the Virginia Mason system. So rather than calling your GP practice, you'll call a call centre. So this call centre, these rooms, or these people here, there's 18 of them, it's a telephone centre. You ring in and they'll say, you know, you've received whatever the GP practice is that you're calling. But they process all of the inbound phone calls, which means that when you ring your GP surgery, you can actually get through to a real voice rather than sitting on hold for ages. What's happening in the GP practice at 8 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 in the morning? The whole care team is having a huddle going, who's coming in today? What do we need to do for these people? So again, from the first moment of the day, they're starting to coordinate care. So the call centre is receiving hundreds and hundreds of calls, but they've geared up. They've got lots of staff in the morning to do that. If you call through, 70% of those calls are because they've emailed you or they've mailed you or whatever and said, you need to come in for this or this or this, so the call centre can book you in. 30% of instances, they need to send you through to somebody. So you actually get to speak to your doctor by phone. Within two to three minutes, your doctor can very quickly tell whether you need to come in today, next week, whether you need to change your medication before you come in so that they can actually see whether you've improved. And the doctors can allocate you to the right care team member because they might say, actually, you don't need to come in to me. You're just confused about your medication. Why do you come in three days' time, speak to the nurse, she'll sort it out for you. So it's a very different management system. You've got nurses, rather than them ringing and reminding people and doing mail-outs, that's done by the call centre, they're actually spending 75% of their time with patients. Doctors are also seeing patients but they see them for half an hour at a time. They see about three patients in a row and then they'll be back on the phones and the emails sorting out things to do with their patients. And the call centre in the afternoon does a lot of recalls and reminders. So it's a very different model of care. This is back to Seattle. So this is the room that I put my RFID tag on. I want to focus on this over here. So this is a standard bit of cabinetry. You often see these sorts of things in doctor's surgeries, but this is a very different one. So when I put my RFID tag on the wall here and sat in this chair, somebody then came through this back door. So these consult rooms have two doors. One's the patient comes through, one the clinicians come through. So back to this little cabinet over here. They doctored a health record for me. So when I arrived, I was a pretend patient. Sitting in that cupboard there is this vacant space and they put in there whatever trolley is needed. So if I'd come in to have a baby way, there'd be a baby way trolley there. If I'd come in to have sutures out, there'd be a sutures trolley. So they knew me enough. So according to my health record, they'd put the right trolley in here. Likewise, the medications and consumables are all up here. They run on a real lifetime system. So as the medications go down at the back, oops, um, in the clinical space behind the consult rooms, they can see all the time whether something's run out. So they never run out when you're in a consultation with a patient. Why have they done that? They don't have any treatment rooms in this facility. They don't have a waiting room and they don't have any treatment rooms because everything comes to the patient. You stay in the room, the clinicians work around you. And it's because they take care of you. And not just you, but your mind and everything about what's happening in your life. So they've got this really integrated model of care They've got a lot more nurses. So in your GP practice, chances are your nurses do immunisations and wounds and maybe a bit of patient education. In these sorts of healthcare home environments, you've got nurses and non-clinical staff supporting you. So a much bigger care team, much more interesting roles for everyone. And they've actually got specific services for patients like I imagine some of you and your family members might be who are the truly complex patient where you've got an entire healthcare team working for you, behind you, 
and dramatically reducing the number of times you need to go to hospital. And it's because of some of the things that we think about sometimes that we need to have an even bigger healthcare team. So in a lot of these facilities, I saw the real integration of psychiatry, psychology, addictions medicine, social work, behavioural counselling, health coaches. I also saw a lot of investment in young people so that we don't create the next generation of, aged care, of chronic disease patients. And it's about tackling how we think about ourselves, our healthcare and our lives more generally. So back to personal care. So this is a different group in the United States, EORA, fastest growing healthcare group in the United States. They're actually a publicly listed company and they only see patients over the age of 65. In Australia, nobody would want to run a healthcare facility for people who are only over the age of 65 because they're the ones more likely to be on five or more medications, go to hospital often and have multiple diagnoses. Here's a healthcare system that does nothing other than over 65 care, and they do it for Medicare, which is the government insurer program in the United States. So before you, actually I'll go backwards a step. So when I went to visit Eora as my internship, I op oops, opened the door and saw this. It was a coffee machine. I thought I'd walked into somebody's tea room. I actually walked out of the facility, walked down the, um, it was in a retail shop, shopping strip and was heading around the corner when I heard somebody calling, well I heard somebody running after me actually, so I then started running. Because um, this was America. And uh, then eventually they yelled out my name and I thought, oh they do know who I am. So I went back. So yes, this is what you see when you first walk in. It's a coffee machine. Every patient can come in, make themselves a coffee. This was their reception desk. It was actually managed by a person who was a medical anthropologist. She was a very interesting receptionist. And before I could get to see any clinicians, I had to spend 20 minutes with a health coach. And again, they dummied up some sort of clinical record for me. Um, so I spent 20 minutes my, with my health coach, and then I got to see a clinician. So it was a very different way of entering care, because in their model, it's the stuff that's happening in people's lives, not the people that cause the healthcare problems, which is where healthcare coaches become really important. Through these doors here, is a big open space that they use to run cooking classes, dancing classes, community sessions, art classes, you name it. And you know what? They've managed to save 37% of the costs of serving an average Medicare insured patient in the United States. So they're doing amazing care. They've got all sorts of new technology, so they email you, you can have Skype consultations, you can have phone consultations, you can do all sorts of stuff that suits you. Um, and when you're actually having your consultation with your clinician, so this was one of the young doctors in their facility, you sit at this little table, it's a round table, no corners to make you feel like you're on the edge of it, and you commonly look at the screen which actually shows you what he's entering into your patient record. So it's a very shared experience of care. So that's just some of what I saw overseas on those 15 plane flights, 43 sites and uh, three months. If you want to hear more about it, down here is a copy of my report which goes into a lot more detail. So thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Tracy. Um, I'd like to get Tracy and Renee back up so that Melissa can actually give them uh, a small gift. Uh, we are running slightly behind schedule, so I'm not sure that we've got time for questions. One, uh, however, about questions, you will find a yellow card on your table. What I'd uh, ask you to do is for the panel session that we've got uh, later in the day, if you've got any questions for them, uh, put it on the yellow card, make sure that you take it to the reception desk uh, and put it into the, the jar. Uh, and if you can do that by the lunch, by the end of the lunch break, that would be great. Uh, we know that the uh, health uh, services report a wide range of challenges uh, and they're trying to engage consumers and the community, so this is your chance to actually come up with some innovative solutions or at least some challenging questions for the, for the panel. We will break for morning tea uh, because we are expecting the, the minister around about 10.30. So uh, if we can take about 10 minutes for morning tea, come back by 10.35 uh, and thank you very much to all of the speakers this morning uh, and for your uh, patience, thank you. <laughs>